Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 22, Project Gemini Flight 10, Gemini 12. EVA is E-A-S-Y. Last time, we covered the high-flying Gemini 11. In most regards, this mission was a great success. Agena operations were seemingly becoming almost routine, with the crew accomplishing a smooth and issue-free rendezvous and docking. The Agena performed admirably when it boosted the spacecraft to record-breaking altitudes and when it lowered their orbit back down again. But once again, EVA proved challenging. Pilot Dick Gordon found himself so exhausted by seemingly simple tasks that command pilot Pete Conrad called an early end to the spacewalk, accomplishing only a fraction of the intended goals. The difficulty of all the Gemini EVAs indicated that there was a fundamental misunderstanding of how these important tasks should be trained for and performed. EVA was an important aspect of the Apollo program, and there was only one flight left to figure it out in Project Gemini. The final flight of Project Gemini would, of course, have another EVA, but the results of Gemini 11 changed the plan. Originally, it was to center on another test of the Air Force's astronaut maneuvering unit. This is the rocket-powered backpack that the Air Force was hoping would enable untethered and versatile spacewalks. It had originally flown on Gemini 9A, but was abandoned when a severely overexerted Gene Cernan was forced to end his EVA early when his helmet faceplate fogged up. The Air Force knew that there wasn't a good chance the AMU would fly as part of Apollo, so this was their last hope. Unfortunately for the Air Force, the results of Gemini 11 forced NASA's hand. After significant debate, the choice was made to refocus Gemini 12's spacewalk on the fundamentals of extravehicular activity. The idea was to perform a series of small, simple tasks in order to quantify exactly what was difficult and why. Along with the fundamental tasks would be an evaluation of several new spacewalk aids that I'll get into in a little bit. In addition to the EVA, Gemini 12 also planned on another Gemini boost exercise, another attempt at the gravity gradient tether exercise, the usual slew of science experiments, and the first manned observation of a solar eclipse from orbit. And much to the command pilot's relief, I'm sure, though this final mission would be longer than the previous few, it would only be four days in duration. Why would the command pilot be relieved at a shorter flight? Because flying as command pilot for Gemini 12 was Jim Lovell. Lovell had flown previously as the pilot aboard the interminable 14-day flight of Gemini 7. For more on his background and on that flight, check out episode 17 of the podcast. This was his second of four space flights. Joining Lovell would be Edwin Aldrin, better known by his then nickname and now legal name, Buzz. And while on that topic, I want to make a quick clarification. I think there's a general perception that the name Buzz has something to do with Aldrin being an astronaut. Maybe associated with jet pilots who buzz the tower? Or maybe because of Toy Story's Buzz Lightyear? I'm not really sure. The actual answer is that when he was a kid, his sister couldn't quite pronounce the word brother, and instead sort of slurred it into buzzer, which eventually got shortened to buzz. You could just squirrel that one away for trivia night. Buzz Aldrin was born on January 20th, 1930, in Glen Ridge, New Jersey. When the time came to go to college, he was offered a full scholarship at MIT, but instead chose to go to West Point, pursuing a military career. There, he earned a degree in mechanical engineering and a commission as second lieutenant in the Air Force. He flew F-86 Sabre fighter jets on 66 combat missions and shot down two MiGs. In 1963, he earned a doctorate in astronautics from MIT. Hey, he went there after all. His focus was on orbital rendezvous, with his thesis titled, quote, Line of Sight Guidance Techniques for Manned Orbital Rendezvous. He even earned himself the nickname Dr. Rendezvous. I took a look at his thesis and found the dedication page to be pretty interesting. It reads, quote, In the hopes that this work may in some way contribute to their exploration of space, this is dedicated to the crew members of this country's present and future manned space programs. If only I could join them in their exciting endeavors. If only, Buzz. Well, he didn't have to wait too long, because ten months later, he was selected as part of Astronaut Group 3. This is his first of two space flights. One of the critical changes made in training for Gemini 12 was the introduction of the neutral buoyancy pool. 
Up until this point, much of the EVA training had been performed on what was essentially a giant air hockey table. Astronauts would suit up and then sit on a special apparatus that would glide across the surface with almost no friction. The idea here was to get the crews used to operating the handheld zip gun, which propelled them around with little bursts of gas. This perhaps did the job of teaching the astronauts how to putt around in zero gravity, but did nothing to prepare them for the exhaustive nature of EVA. Another training aid was a modified C-131 cargo airplane that was flown in a special trajectory that resulted in brief periods of weightlessness. This plane came to be known as the Vomit Comet since not everyone handled the sudden disorientation of weightlessness well. Training on the Vomit Comet was great since it truly reproduced weightlessness. The catch was that it could only reproduce about 30 seconds of weightlessness. EVA crews practiced a few short tasks, but since they were forced to take breaks when the plane pulled up and their weight returned, they never encountered the exhaustion associated with this lengthy spacewalk. The effort level required for a spacewalk is something I've perhaps not quite elaborated on properly. EVA seems like it should be a piece of cake. You're literally just floating around. When you grab onto a handhold, you're weightless, so it's not like you have to exert your muscles to hold yourself up. But this is a bit misleading. Let's start with the suit itself. A spacesuit is a flexible, human-shaped spaceship full of pressurized air. Since it's full of pressurized air, it doesn't want to bend. Imagine a long, thin balloon, like those ones people use to make balloon animals. Bending one of those doesn't take a ton of effort, but what happens when you let go? It snaps back into place. This is exactly what happens on a much larger and more pressurized spacesuit. It has a default position that it wants to be in. When the astronaut moves his legs or bends his arms, he has to fight against that tendency to snap back into position. Depending on the air pressure in the suit, the design of the joints, and the thickness of the material, this can be pretty difficult. No one action is going to be all that hard, but over time, even simple movements can start to tire you out. To be honest, this seems like something they could have figured out better on the ground, but it's a little more understandable that they missed the other aspect of what makes EVA so hard. When you walk around and do stuff on Earth, you are constantly bracing yourself against the inevitable equal and opposite reaction that comes with whatever you're doing. If you're standing up and move one leg forward, the friction between your other foot and the ground keeps the rest of you in place. When you open the door to your fridge, the friction between both of your feet and the ground keeps you from just sliding into the fridge. Imagine having to open the door to your fridge while standing on ice, and you'll start to get an idea of why this is so difficult. You could do it, but you'd have to brace yourself against something else. You'd also end up using some different muscles, maybe your abs, to stay rigid while bracing. And if your other hand is occupied with a tool or a camera, this can all get pretty tricky pretty fast. But even when the astronaut wasn't interacting with another object, EVA could still prove challenging. Let's say you move your right arm across your chest to pick up something on the left. What's going to happen? Equal and opposite reaction. If I'm remembering my physics properly, you'd start to rotate clockwise. Raise your arm up and you'd start rotating forwards. The result is that without proper training and restraints, you just end up constantly moving and then correcting those movements. I'm getting tired just thinking about it. So what was to be done about this? Hit the pool. Though there was some pushback, and there's always some pushback, there were a growing number of voices, including from Aldrin, advocating for the use of neutral buoyancy pool training. In this style of training, the astronaut would wear a suit similar to their spacesuit, but carefully weighted and ballasted such that when they were underwater, their weight and buoyancy canceled out. This approach had a number of benefits. First, by making the trainee force their limbs through the heavy water, it was a much better approximation of the effort required to perform their tasks in the pressurized spacesuit. They could better determine when the astronaut would need a break and for how long. This alone could be a huge breakthrough. Previous astronauts had just tried to power through their exhaustion due to the tight schedule. If mission planners could adequately plan for rest periods, the astronaut wouldn't feel compelled to overexert himself. Second, the effect wouldn't be quite the same, but since floating in a pool is sort of like moving in microgravity, it would be possible to determine when the astronaut would need some help staying in place, and even evaluate different techniques right on Earth. 
I don't want to spoil the episode and give away the effects of neutral buoyancy training on this mission, but I will tell you that there's now a 6.2 million gallon pool at the Johnson Space Center. I wonder what that could be used for. Only 20 months after the launch of Gemini 3, the time had come for the final flight in Project Gemini. Gemini 12 was originally slated for launch on November 9, 1966, but the shortage of spare parts had finally caught up with the program, and the launch was delayed by two days. Sadly, this delay meant that the solar eclipse observations had to be scrapped, since with the new timeline the crew would be high above their usual orbit, thanks to the planned Agena boost. Two days later, for real this time, the stage was set. The Atlas successfully carried its Agena payload into orbit, and Gemini 12 soon followed it. I haven't been able to find a timeline on this, but it seems that teardown on the Gemini launch pad may have started as soon as later that day. I guess they meant it when they said this was the last flight. As usual, first on the agenda was the Agena. But there was a problem. As the spacecraft approached their target, the rendezvous radar failed. In a twist that could have come out of a Hollywood movie, one of the foremost rendezvous experts in the world, and certainly in the astronaut corps, was riding shotgun. Buzz Dr. Rendezvous Aldrin was able to put his work to the test. Using nothing more than a sextant and the charts he himself helped develop, he was able to guide Jim Lovell into a successful rendezvous and docking. The original plan was to fire up the Agena PPS at this point and boost their orbit, similar to Gemini 11, but this had to be scrapped. As the Agena finished its orbital insertion that started with a boost from the Atlas rocket, engineers on the ground noticed some strange telemetry coming from its engine. It clearly hadn't blown up or anything like that, but something was fishy. Out of an abundance of caution, mission controllers decided not to use the PPS leaving Gemini 12 in its lower initial orbit. However, this created a new opportunity. Remember that solar eclipse? The two-day delay meant they would be in a high orbit when it happened, but now the high orbit was off the table. Mission controllers and the scientists involved with the eclipse observation scrambled and figured out how to get Gemini 12 in the right position after all. The crew was initially on board, but later came to somewhat regret the impromptu maneuvers since it made their already complicated work and sleep schedule even more complicated. Those astronaut crews are pretty adaptable though, so despite the surprise planning, they successfully performed the first human observation of a solar eclipse from space. But returning to things that were planned, it was time for Buzz Aldrin's first EVA. Taking a lesson from previous flights, they decided to ease into it with a stand-up EVA. Aldrin opened his door, stood up, resisted the urge to simply stare at the view, and got to work. When it was dark out, he took some ultraviolet photos of the stars. When it was light out, he did some prep work for his full EVA. He installed some rails, set up a video camera, retrieved a science experiment from outside the spacecraft, and took some normal visible light photos. Incidentally, I'm not sure where in the flight this happened, but it was on this flight that Buzz Aldrin turned the camera around and took the first space selfie. The whole time he was outside, he studied his movement and the reactions to his movement, using the stand-up EVA as last-minute training for the full EVA. The stand-up EVA was successful, and Aldrin re-entered the capsule and closed the hatch. One crew sleep period later, and it was time to see if all that training had finally cracked the code on EVA. Once again, Aldrin opened his hatch, and this time floated gently through it. During the stand-up EVA, Aldrin had installed a long pole that connected the Gemini and Agena for use as a handrail. He now used this handrail to easily move himself over to the Agena. Once there, he attached a tether to his waist, freeing up his hands, and set up the much longer tether used for the gravity gradient exercise. What had taken Dick Gordon to the edge of his physical ability had been accomplished with ease. A promising start. With the gravity gradient experiment set up, Aldrin used the handrail again to make his way back to the Gemini, and then back to the adapter section. Here he tried another new spacewalk aid, slipper-style foot restraints, 
he slipped his feet inside and found that they did a perfect job of keeping him in place without any significant effort. He was free to focus on the task in front of him while completely relaxed. From here, he got started on the various bolts, tools, connectors, and other items to evaluate his ability to perform work while outside the spacecraft. With his new tethers and restraints, this posed no difficulty at all. Lastly, he again made his way back to the hatch area and took a moment to wipe off Jim Lovell's window. Lovell asked him if he could change the oil too while he was at it. Two hours after it started, Aldrin's EVA came to a close when he pulled the hatch shut again. It was a complete success. At long last, NASA had overcome the confounding difficulties of extravehicular activity and achieved one of the core goals of Project Gemini. I love the story of EVA with Gemini because it perfectly exemplifies why Project Gemini was so important. Most of the EVAs for Apollo were planned for the lunar surface, but those crews would need that ability for contingency operations at least. If Gemini hadn't been around to figure out how to do it efficiently, Apollo would have had to dedicate several missions to EVA, especially when it became apparent that it was much harder than expected. Could the moon landing have happened before the end of the decade without Gemini's hard-won EVA lessons? Maybe. But it was one more problem that the Apollo mission planners just didn't have to deal with. And the more solved problems they could start with, the better. But there were still non-EVA tasks to attend to. The crew opened the hatch and chucked out the EVA equipment they no longer needed, dooming it to burn up in the atmosphere in a few days or weeks. They also tried the gravity gradient tether exercise again. Much like Conrad, Lovell found that he couldn't quite get the tether to go taut. There was always some slack, which induced motion in both vehicles, which further prevented a nice tight tether. They eventually got into the proper position with the Agena directly underneath the Gemini, but with the large oscillations of the spacecraft, this didn't seem to be the worry-free station-keeping method everyone hoped it would be. One last little story to tell about Gemini 12 involves an acting-up fuel cell. One of the side effects of making electricity with a fuel cell is the generation of water. The crew didn't actually drink this water, but their water and the fuel cell water shared a container, each in their own separate bags. Something went wrong with one of the fuel cells that caused it to start generating more water than expected. This meant that if something wasn't done, the space for water would run out and they would be forced to shut down the fuel cell. In order to make room, the astronauts were instructed to drink as much water as possible, thus reducing the amount in the container and making room for the fuel cell water. The water eventually passed through the astronauts and was vented overboard in their urine dumps. That's one way to do it, I guess. Four days passed quickly in space, and before long, it was time for the final re-entry of Project Gemini. Like the flight before, this was to be a fully automated, computer-controlled entry. Once again, the computer performed its task admirably, and the spacecraft splashed down just three miles from the target point. And at that moment, at 12.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 15, 1966, Project Gemini came to a close. Well, not quite. That wouldn't happen for a few more months after all the reports had been written, equipment decommissioned, and so on, but that doesn't make for a nice story. Ten flights, twenty months, and sixteen astronauts later, it was over. Next time on The Space Above Us, we will give Project Gemini the send-off it deserves with a look back at the program. We'll re-examine its original goals, along with how well it achieved them, and take a whirlwind tour through all ten flights once again, examining their successes and failures. We'll also try to fit it into the greater spaceflight picture by looking at its place among Mercury, Apollo, and even a little bit of the Soviet space program. If you, my dear listeners, have any other questions about Gemini that I haven't yet addressed, now would be the time to send them in. As always, you can reach me via email at jp at thespaceabove.us, via Twitter at spaceaboveus, or via Facebook facebook.com slash thespaceaboveus. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>